Hi, my name is Jenny Pinedo, and I'm going to do a presentation on women in mathematics, specifically um, Emily, Gabrielle Emily Le Tonnelier de Breteau, which was uh, one of the women in the 18th century that revolutionized the mathematics and science. Uh, first of all, I'm going to do a review of her life. I'm going to go over her background, her family, and how uh, the first step of, my, of Emily in the words of science and mathematics. Emily was born in um, Paris on December 17, in 1706. Uh, she was part of a noble family. Her father was uh, Louis Nicolas um, Le Tournelier de Breteau, which was uh, one of the principal officers in the household of the king Louis XIV, the um, common, uh, his common known as the Sun King. Uh, because he was um, he ruled during the likes of enlightenment in France. Uh, when Emily was about ten years old, uh, her father realized that she was uh, she had a really a really good talent. He was not a prodigious child, but he was really good on science. Um, so he um, prevented her mother from sending to a convent which was the most common uh, source of education for ladies in that time. Um, it's good to remind that uh, during this time, uh, Emily grew up in a society that women's, the best expectation that a woman could have is get a good marriage and be a good wife. And definitely that's not related with science, that's nothing related with mathematics. So, and Emily loved mathematics, so Emily has to go over a lot of um, so um, Emily and uh, her father had tutors to uh, teach Emily and her brothers uh, mathematics, science, literature. Um, by the age of 12, Emily had already learned multiple languages, such as Latin, Greek, and German, and a little bit of English. The learn part of learning language was common for a lady in that time because she had to, uh, she's supposed to attend to um, serve the visitor of her house. But um, Emily was more than a lady that learned um, languages. Emily uh, loved math and she had really good tutors. So um, uh, between the first tutors that Emily had during her life, uh, we can find um, Bernard Le Bovier de Fontenelle, which was, by the time he tutored Emily, was the uh, director of the, s or mainly the secretary of the French Academy of Science. Um, that was a big thing, because um, that's, that means that it was a precision man and was teaching a woman, which was odd for this time. Um, also, her which made other the education of Emily was that um, she was instructed also in gymnastics, in riding, and <coughs> other sports that for this time just meant practice. So that was kind of odd for this education, but um, <coughs> Emily also was instructed in music, in art, as any other girl in the time. Um, in the aristocracy, of course, because uh, if she, um, okay, so uh, the ex of 16, Emily was introduced to the Court of Versailles, which was the famous Court of France. Any girls um, that uh, was part of the of a noble family have to um, be introduced to this court. There she will meet a future husband, which was the main goal for any woman this time, but not for Emily. <coughs> Uh, in this place, Emily l learned to love the glamour of the court. She kept her love for mathematics, for science. She kept studying geometry, which was her big passion, but she learned a little bit more about the life in the court, and he li she liked it. Too much for being a girl, because um, she loved playing. She lost a lot of money playing, and that was <laughs> ad for being a woman. <laughs> that was not common. Um, in 1725, when she was 18, as was common in this time, uh, her family arranged a marriage with one of the most com with one of the most famous um, lineage from the from France in that time, um, the Marquis du Châtelet. Um, here I have a video link 
to do like a, um, to show. Uh, I did. Uh, I talked already a little bit about the background of her life, and but it's better to see a video with the music, with the um, how it was really was the life in that time and the life, especially in the court and for a woman. So I put some in it here. <laughs> Enlightenment is an era in Western history in which many changes took place in philosophical, intellectual, scientific, and cultural life. This movement took place throughout the 18th century and spanned most of the Western world, including France, England, Germany, Italy, and even into North America. It was heavily influenced by the rise of modern science and by the aftermath of religious conflicts that came about during the Reformation period. Leaders of the Enlightenment movement were known as philosophes and were committed to worldly views based on reason and human understanding, which they believed would lead to beneficial changes for society. The Enlightenment was not a single movement or set of ideas, but more a set of values. It was based on critical questioning of traditional institutions, customs, and morals, and a strong belief in rationality and science. These philosophes were attempting to continue the work of 17th century thinkers such as Galileo, Descartes, and Isaac Newton who had developed methods of rational inquiry and had worked to show that knowledge was essential for human development. The New Enlightenment philosophes believed that science could unravel nature's mysteries and teach us how to control it. This time period pushed to extend scientific methods into every field of learning and set Western culture on a pathway toward modern social sciences. Um, the video is long, so I'm gonna put uh, part of the video that uh, I think is the most important. Uh, points that we have to go with the Women were seen as insatiable, easily swayed, and more extend scientific methods into every phase of modernity, which turned from philosophy and instead emphasized social conditions. During the Enlightenment, women were seen as insatiable, easily swayed, and morally faulty. Their opinions were not highly regarded, and many thought that their place was in the home. However, in the Enlightenment period, women were starting to overcome the idea that they were not worthy as a voice of reason. Women. So, so this uh, was the case of Emily. Um, she fought for her rights, and she thought that she had the knowledge, the same knowledge as other men in this, in this time. So why she have, uh, why she can be recognized as a true scientific of, of, of the true love of mathematics that was her. So Emily, um, between the early, this was not in the early childhood, but more as um, during the first year of the adolescence, Emily has famous tutors, thanks to the position of her father, that helped a lot in the development of Emily in science. Some of her tutors was Pierre-Louis de Maberti, which was uh, famous in her time. Also, Alex Claude Claron, which was a child prodigy pro in this time, and another of the um, tutors of Emily, and Samuel Koenix. Uh, this uh, last one, Emily has some uh, encounters uh, because they differ on some of the um, uh, theories. And we're gonna see that in this time, uh, Emily was a Newtonian. She loved, um, not love, but uh, she liked the new theories that I say Newton was uh, presenting. But uh, due to the to political situation and religion, Newton was not accepted in France. But even though Emily analyzed and go over his work, and we're gonna see after that uh, that um, most of Emily's work was based on analyzing and proving even. Um, rectifying uh, uh, Newton's work. Voltaire was uh, the most famous tutor of Emily, and unfortunately Emily has passed to a history not because of her big talent in mathematics and science, but because of being one of the lovers of Voltaire. But that's common <laughs> for this time due to, as we saw in the video, that the, um, the 
how people think about women this time. Um, it's sad because she um, worked with Voltaire at the part of him, I mean, by his side, and many of the work of Voltaire wouldn't have been done uh, without Emily. Um, Uh, now I'm going to talk about some of the, of the words of Emily and some of those include Voltaire. Uh, specifically, I'm going to talk the ones that are related with science because Emily didn't uh, focus just on science. She focused on philosophy. She had a broader um, uh, area of study, but since her passion was mathematics and science and physics specifically, I'm going to talk about the, uh, his um, most important words in this part. Um, the first word where uh, the name of Emily appeared was uh, Voltaire's word, was Element de la Philosophie de Newton, which means the elements of Newton philosophy. Um, in this uh, book, which was a book, um, Emily, uh, uh, this book was published in 1738, and the main goal of this book was giving a mathematic outline of the um, Newton's proof of the uh, love equals areas applied to the um, uh, centripetal force. So Emily, uh, this work uh, can be done without mathematics. And Voltaire was not big fan of mathematics, he was more a philosopher, so the part of mathematics in this work was made by Emily. And he recognized that, he wrote to one of his friends that he wouldn't uh, start this project without the help of Emily. It, was, uh, it wouldn't be impossible to finish this work because Emily did all the proof of the, um, of the mathematical proofs in this, in this work. Um, in the name, uh, the book was published in the name of Voltaire, but Emily, he mentioned Emily as one of the collaborators, and this was the first time that the name of Emily du Châtelet, uh, since she married with the Marquis du Châtelet, she adopted that name, so that was the first time that, that her name appeared in a, in a paper and was a big thing because uh, it's not common for a woman to publish a paper or appear. It was common to appear as a, a, uh, someone that helped a guy, but not this way, like the way that Voltaire represents Emily. This is a picture of this, um, of the front part of the, of the book. So after this paper, um, Emily did a big step S in this part. She was just the um, person who had filter, but now Emily, um, in kind of uh, a spontaneous way, she wrote her first paper. Um, this uh, paper was about the nature of unpropagation of light, and it started in a spontaneous way. She started helping Voltaire in uh, experiments because Voltaire uh, was sure that fire was matter and half mass. So she, he wanted pro to prove that. And he repeated some of Newton's experiments on optics and <laughs> all the experiments that he did. He couldn't find anything related that, that fire half mass. But he continued. He was secure that that was what, what was, even if the experiments didn't show that. But Emily's intuition told her that that was not true. But she didn't want to hurt her mentor feelings. So she started doing experiments by herself, uh, uh, rustic experiments um, without Voltaire knowing. So she started doing so simple experiments, such as washing the clothes and waiting until the clothes get dry. So she realized the difference of the um, the difference of the the color of the clothes and the time that they sp they uh, dry, and there were so simplistic experiments. But she got those details. Um, she wrote papers and telling that um, um, different uh, colors have different temperatures. Or at, or at, um, and quite um, heat in different rates. So she realized that the violet or purple colors uh, dry first, the clothes that have that color dry first, and the red colors dry uh, the last ones. So this was the first time that someone analyzed, uh, analyzed this, um, this part of the light and propagation. 
uh, preparation of life, and this was uh, an introduction of the first, or actually the first time that someone uh, predict something about the uh, infrared radiation. Today's day we know as infrared radiation. She just um, um, said that someone else has to f uh, keep doing some experiments. Nobody in the in the time, actually someone heard, but nobody uh, start doing what she mentioned they should do experiments about that. Because um, <coughs> so she predicted the infrared radiation back in these times. Um, at this paper um, was like I said this before. It was um, it wasn't supposed to be published, but um, Polte didn't care, and he loved the the paper, and he encouraged her to publish it. So she sent the paper to the Academy of Science in France, and they liked the paper. And thanks to this paper, she became part of the Science Academy of France. She was the first woman of a part. Um, of an academy of science in France. Although she became part of the academy, she was seen as, oh, the woman that is part. Oh, Emily, they make fun of her. Um, they liked the paper, but they didn't exactly pay much attention. So the second book of Emily, actually the first book, but the second publication, was um, also kind of um, uh, Emily loves mathematics, so each time that he has a moment to apply or to study something on geometry or physics, she did it. So in this, in, at this moment, she also was a mom, so she had to um, grow um, help in the, in the care of her son. So by this time, in uh, 1740, um, her bigger son was learning. Um, physics and she was worried because she didn't uh, find a good tutor for him and she realized that the books of the time didn't recover all the new um, discoveries on physics so she started her own project she started doing research on mathematics on geometry on physics on chemistry even um, and she collect all the work from famous um, scientific uh, such as Godfrey Leaf, Wilman Gravestone, and Isaac Newton, which was her preferred uh, scientific on the, the time. So um, she started doing research and she go over the, the experiments and she realized that some of the work weren't exactly related, which was some, something that um, came to a time that in France they didn't accept Isaac Newton's work because uh, the most uh, they prefer Leib's uh, Leib's uh, experiments, and they uh, saw Newton as someone that opposed religion because of the his um, theories of gravitation. S but she knew how to relate these two words, and she realized that some of the experiment, some of the uh, theories planted by Newton, have some problems. Because um, one of the William Gravesend Grace uh, experiments in which he uh, dropped a ball of um, to a clan to clan and he started measuring the velocity of the ball and the profu profundity of the clan when the ball dropped when, when the ball uh, hit the, f the floor um, to realize that that experiment didn't correspond exactly with the um, with the relationship that uh, Newton established between energy, mass, and velocity. So she, using geometry, she um, correct this formula. And she, real, she correct this formula, and in reality, um, the, uh, she, pull, um, she um, gave the real relationship between the uh, energy, mass, and velocity which is energy is going to be like uh, one half the mass and the velocity square, which was the problem that uh, Newton had uh, with her, his first uh, relation, the first relationship he established between energy and velocity. Uh, this f is a big thing in the history of science, the, this formula. I mean, this relationship was used by Einstein development, development on theory of relativity, and is the is still used as the, the way to get uh, calculate the kinetic energy. 
Notice that uh, Newton error formula is the derivative of the correct exactly. formula. Newton was measured the rate of change than the the so cycle kinetic energy, kinetic energy of the of the object. Um, the best known mm, mm, project of Emily is the Principia Mathematica. Actually, it's the traduction to the Principia Mathematica of Newton. We say now, uh, yeah, it's a traduction. That's something for people that learn languages. No, for mathematics, that's nothing to do with mathematics. But in reality, it is. Because in this time, Newton was not known in France. And the small country of people that knew Newton didn't understand her work. His work. Uh, Emily did understand her work and traduced from a Latin version. And actually, that's the only version that we have now in France. And it's the only uh, traduction to the Principia Mathematica that have been done in the history. Um, also, she uh, add to this um, traduction, her own explanation, and algebraic work and geometric work of the of Newton uh, Principia of Mathematica. Um, this was a big thing for the women. Men in that time didn't understand what Newton was talking about, and she did it. And she got a lot of critic, uh, critique about this paper. Uh, many of the men in the Academy of Science lie of her. They didn't understand what she was talking about, but uh, in a way, she, she was brilliant. So she published this paper. This was the last paper. Actually, she didn't publish, because it was the last page paper she did in her life. Um, she was pregnant by the time she did this paper. So she, she set as a goal to finish because uh, before her pregnancy was ended. And she finished it because before that, um, this is one of the. Uh, this is the front page of the of that paper. This is some of the calculations she did. Geometry. Uh, Emily loves geometry. Emily. Uh, Emily uh, says that with geometry, um, everything in mathematics and calculus is easier because geometry shows the show to the common people and show the the in an easy way how the things are made. Um, Emily finished this paper uh, before uh, she gave birth. Um, some Voltaire always was in her. One time he, <laughs> he, he wrote that uh, being at the desk working on Newton, she fell her little car. The little car was her daughter, who appeared an instant. Uh, she was late in the quattro book of geometry while her mother got her to get her papers. That gives an idea that, yeah, she finished it, but <laughs> almost giving birth to her, her daughter. And unfortunately, he died, she died some days after that from a pulmonary embolism. The little girl died uh, a few days before, but she had time to uh, finish the paper and to sign the paper um, as May uh, uh, September 10, uh, 1749. Why Emily has to be part of the of the big uh, um, mathematics uh, women's in mathematics? Um, she um, she loved mathematics and she um, big big uh, she wrote these papers with um, <coughs> uh, which uh, made big approach to the science. The first paper was awesome, and this time nobody uh, uh, wondered about the different lights and uh, even think about the <laughs> radiation or, or infrared radiation also. Um, she did things that men in her time didn't do. And she's five for her place in society. People love her. Um, she, didn't, she couldn't assist to institutions to, uh, to learn by uh, on the institution that men used to, to be like the schools. Uh, but she has to hire tutors, she has to spend hours teaching herself. And even though she did things that men didn't do in that time, um, she, have to, uh, she didn't have access to the, to the places that men have in this time. Um, sometimes she has to dress as a man to get into the libraries or to get into the coffees. Uh, coffees uh, places in this time were the main point of, um, of where men 
uh, get, uh, get together to talk about science, science about to get a new discovery, and uh, their ideas. Mary couldn't, uh, Emily couldn't assist to these places, but uh, a no was not uh, enough for her, so she tried way to get in. She dressed as a man. Every, everybody there knew that if she was a girl, she was Emily, but they didn't care because some of them appreciate, some of them recognize her talent, and some of those, some others just make fun of her. But he didn't, she didn't just uh, go there to hear, to hear others talk. She presented her ideas, and that was a big thing for women in her time. Some other women of probably a part of her family So Emily as a clown or something. They didn't understand her this time. Um, I have a video here about this last part that I just saw on the the same video that I put before and talk about the coffee houses in France, which was the place where Emily uh, tried to see some dress as a man to get in. So. Specifically, this is in England, but uh, the same place uh, in France, they, like, they copy this. In England, during the 17th and 18th centuries, coffee houses were public social places in which patrons would gather for conversation and social interaction while drinking coffee, a newly emerging beverage of the time, though other beverages such as tea and chocolate were served as well. For the price of a penny, men bought a cup of coffee and admission to the coffee house where they would engage in conversation. The coffee houses of the Enlightenment period were also known as penny universities. In England, coffee houses maintained a mostly egalitarian atmosphere despite the widespread exclusion of women and became, in many ways, centers of enlightenment thinking. And um, this uh, gives an idea what I said. Well, it was a coffee house. Now we see a coffee house like just a place, but uh, in this time it was uh, really hard to for a woman to assist to these places. Uh, also, Emily used her abilities on mathematics and science in her daily life. So, like I said before, she loved the court, she loved that way of life. She loved parties. Uh, so, um, and she loved playing and she, lo uh, she lost a lot of money in this and that was not good for a woman this time. So she had to uh, come out with a way to get back all that money that she lost. So she used derivative and she created uh, a credit system in which she maximized the, the amount of money that she uh, loaned to get <laughs> back her money. Because she has to report uh, the money of her husband. I mean, it was she was a woman. She she had nothing <laughs> more than her knowledge, but it was enough for her to uh, get out of big problems. <laughs> so, um, so this is my presentation. If you have any questions, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh,